Good morning and welcome to today's conference on climate and sustainability risks and opportunities organized by the National Bank of Slovakia. I'm honored to be here with such a distinguished group of financial leaders and experts. I would like to extend our warm welcome to our panelists and guests who have gathered here today to engage in hopefully insightful discussions. Once again, good morning. As we gather here today, we are faced with both challenges and opportunities, not only in the banking industry. The year 2022 saw major political and economical changes with post-pandemic turmoil, Russia's war in Ukraine causing greater uncertainty and market volatility, and a consequent negative impact on energy supplies. While short-term and urgent issues command our attention, the risks of major economic, financial and political upheavals caused by climate change effects are only growing. With more frequent extreme weather events, the natural systems on which business operations and socio-economic structures rely are now at risk of serious disruption. We will need resources and skill sets to manage a changing risk landscape. I believe today's speeches and discussions will provide us with valuable insights and a unique perspective on the issue. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce the governor of the National Bank of Slovakia, Mr. Peter Kazimir. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our special one-day event focused on climate and sustainability-related risks. Never was the life of uh, central bankers, businesses, uh, and policymakers as puzzling and challenging as it is uh, today. The emergence of new structural challenges uh, fundamentally changes the game for all of us. Climate change ranks among the most uh, difficult and, and ones. Let's imagine it's uh, 2021, it's Christmas, and Netflix is releasing a long-awaited movie, Don't Look Up. The stellar cast is secondary to the story. Two almost uh, unknown astronomers discover a comet rushing towards um, Earth on, on a collision course. But uh, surprisingly, uh, this is not the biggest problem. The, the primary concern is that only, only some people care. After all warning and, and preparing humanity for life extension event is very annoying and laborious, and, and no one knows how to, how to cope in this situation. Said as it may be, this work of uh, fiction carries away too many similarities with our resolve to seek solutions to, to intensifying impacts of climate change on our lives and, and the economy. As far as I recall, the most common response to climate change is the question, what does that have to do with me, with my family, with my business and uh, our policies? Well, not so much today, but uh, it can alter our way of life as we know it, it tomorrow. Many ask whether the consequences of climate change are the ultimate and, and worrisome. The simple answer to this is yes, they are. We are beginning to experience it more and more intensely at home in the country we, we know best. No other country has, compared to its size, as many mineral springs as my homeland, Slovakia, water rich for, for centuries, and yet we suffer, we suffer from droughts. In January this year, the Slovak Hydro Meteorological Institute published a report on the last year's drought in, in Slovakia, and it reads as follows. 
the year 2022 was exceptional in terms of drought occurrence in, in Slovakia. Arid conditions uh, occurred in, in more than half of the country and the drought duration in some places was more than 200 days. In most districts in Slovakia, the harvest was meager and the drought significantly affected forest ecosystems. Even those, even those seemingly insignificant and for many negligible changes changed the entire ecosystem. Higher temperatures exacerbate many types of disasters, including storms, heat waves, floods, and droughts. A warmer climate creates an atmosphere that can collect, retain, and, and, and release more water and changes weather conditions so that wet areas become drier and, and drier. Let's rewind and, and look at what all this has to do with central bankers. The role of a central bank is uh, definitely is not to pivot, but, uh, but to drive the response. It's primarily up to the governments, academia, innovators, and, and businesses. They are the first line of defense. Our role, our role is more of a facilitator, and, and we are facilitators, supporters. Still, how does it all relate to the financial sectors, uh, stability, sustainability, and resilience of the financial system, policymakers, businesses, and definitely us? The topic of, of uh, today's conference is sustainability opportunities and risks in, in the context of the impacts of climate change. Since, since childhood, all of us have been indoctrinated and, and guided by our parents not to put off until tomorrow what uh, can be done and, and fixed uh, today. I do agree it's a wise but often annoying principle, nevertheless uh, well on the spot. The devil's advocate would raise a hand and uh, remind me that future generations will be more innovative and, and have enhanced and, and cutting-edge technologies uh, dwarfing today's capabilities. As a result, hopefully they will be able to solve problems insurmountable for us today. Sure, but it can be too late. It's called the tragedy of the time horizon. The National Bank of Slovakia, the ECB, and other central banks and supervisors from around the world can and will play its part and help the change to happen within our mandates. Rigorous analysis uh, will be a crucial tool. We have a platform for that. It's called the uh, NGFS. And NGFS has developed a typical picture of what our economies might look like under different uh, assumptions together with uh, leading academic climate institutions. And these are called uh, climate scenarios. We are starting to, to understand better risks related to the green transition. Uh, we can now uh, um, identify physical and macrofinancial risks. And these climate scenarios can help policymakers, financial institutions, businesses and the public to deal with uncertainty ahead to, to better understand it. We can't fix everything today, and we won't, and we will don't need to. We, so, so we need to stay agile but realistic. The last thing uh, is to overburn, to overregulate to the financial system and do more harm than damage, what we used to do in, in Europe so often. And there are, in my view, there are five things for us to do to help to steer the public debate, as we try today, for example, to drive collaboration among the central banks, market supervisors, here the NGFS is vital, to assist uh, financial institutions with the transition, then invest in data collection, quality and granularity of data, analyze them and create scenarios, 
And finally, enhance um, our models and, and forecasting, so lovely forecasting to, to understand climate change impacts on, on inflation better. And all this, all this is doable and, and already in motion. So I'm, I'm really quite optimistic that together we can manage even these uh, challenges. As Albert, Albert Camus once said, real generosity toward the future lies in giving all to the present. But enough from, from my side. It's my pleasure and, and privilege to welcome my good friend, uh, Klaas Knott, who, apart from being the distinguished president of, of Dutch Central Bank uh, and the longest serving member of our, our governing council, and is also the chair of the Financial Stability Board. An, an old Dutch proverb says that even the sun doesn't rise in the morning for free. And meaning Dutch uh, uh, knew for centuries that we will have to pay up one, one day. And it seems that day has, has arrived. So enjoy today's conference. And class, please, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. hear me well and well at least I can see myself so I guess you can see me and I hope that the audio is also okay thank you very much uh, Peter again uh, for having me at this conference at a day uh, in which I think the word crisis has clearly uh, a multiple meaning uh, uh, our thoughts are of course with the many casualties uh, that we've all seen from the terrible earthquake in uh, Turkey and, and Syria. Um, but today I want to talk about a different crisis, and that's the crisis on which this uh, conference is dedicated, and that has to do with the climate crisis. Um, I want to start with a quote, and I hope that you will all uh, immediately recognize this quote. I quote, in Slovakia, 42% of young people are very worried about the climate crisis. 73% think that humanity has failed to look after our planet. Two thirds find politicians' actions to address the climate crisis disappointing. A recent study carried out in a number of other countries has shown that 40% of young people are considering not having children because of the climate crisis. It is clear the next generation knows we're running out of time." End of quote. Those were actually the words of your president, Susanna Chaputova, at the United Nations Climate Conference in Glasgow. Words that deeply impressed me as a world citizen, as a central banker, but also as a father. It is not often that statistics are so vivid, so visual, even though our economist heart always thinks they are. She was so right. The climate crisis is a crisis that is all encompassing and one that we've seen coming for a long time. And that's what sets this crisis, this challenge, apart from other challenges that we are facing. We could have seen it coming, but we sat on our hands and we stared at each other instead of taking action. And now we're running out of time. So as your president stated, we must double down on our efforts to mitigate the impact of the climate crisis to reverse the devastation of our planet. It was obvious that she was not talking about tomorrow, but that she was talking about today. To show young people, our children, that our generation also knows we are running out of time. Of course, her call to action was addressed at politicians, not at central bankers, but I am convinced that we can also have an important role to play. That was also the conclusion that we reached in my first year as president of the Dutch Central Bank in 2011. During a team building weekend at sea, we, my colleagues at the executive board and I, we talked about our goals, our view for the future, the future of the bank, 
and the future of the financial sector. And that was necessary because in 2011, the financial sector and our economy were recovering from the blows of the financial crisis. A crisis that, in addition to costing a great deal of money, had also cost citizens confidence in banks in the financial sector. So we had to restore that confidence for our citizens and our sector, for our economy and for our future. The question was, of course, how? We decided that our mission as a central bank and as a financial supervisor should focus more on our contribution to sustainable prosperity and hence sustainable finance. We decided that we would choose to emphasize the long term instead of the short term. To look beyond financial welfare to well-being, to look beyond mere economic growth to inclusive, sustainable growth because we were convinced that sustainability was a prerequisite to restore confidence, a prerequisite to safeguard the future for our citizens and for our financial sector. 11 years ago, that was, I may say so myself, a bold decision because sustainability was not yet mainstream. It was not yet on every agenda. But what could and can a central bank, what can we do to help save our planet? Definitely not everything. As my colleague Peter Casimir already pointed out, we are not elected politicians. We are not in the driving seat, but we are definitely part of the team. A part of the team in three different ways, in three different roles that I want to briefly elaborate on. As a supervisor and regulator, as a long-term economic advisor and as a leader by example. One of our first steps was the development of a sustainable finance strategy with the aim to having sustainability integrated into all our core tasks by 2025. This strategy sets out a clear path to really make a difference in all the three roles that I just mentioned and to move the needle on becoming more sustainable while respecting the boundaries of our mandate. And that was an important step. Over the past decade, we did more, we took more steps to take our place in the team. And in this speech, I intend to give some examples. Not an exhaustive list, but things that we can do as an inspiration for what you can do, for what we can do together. To start with the obvious, as a supervisor and regulator, we have a responsibility to address macro and micro prudential risks and thereby contribute to financial stability. In this capacity, we can help guide financial institutions to identify, recognize and mitigate risks, including climate related risks. And should such risks materialize, prevent them from having serious consequences. To give a few examples here, we have developed a climate stress testing framework for transition risks, which we will expand this year to also include a focus on physical risks. Also late last year, DNB published a guide with good practices to control climate and environment related risks. This guide was particularly aimed at insurance and pension funds and was in line with the ECB's 2020 guide, which was aimed at the banks. It seeks to provide financial institutions with constructive good practices to help with their risk management. In the near term, we aim to integrate climate and environment related risks into our regular periodic supervision. Second, our role as a long term economic advisor is, of course, based on accumulated knowledge on data and facts. We are central bankers, we're not philosophers. Before we tackle a problem, we have to understand it. And in order to understand it, we have to quantify it. So we accumulate essential data to monitor developments in order to take effective decisions. We do that as a national central bank, but especially in tandem with other organizations like the ECB and like the FSB, the Financial Stability Board. For example, statisticians from central banks in the euro area have recently been working hard with the ECB to generate sustainability data, data that indicate the carbon footprint of the financial sector's investments 
which can be used to gauge the degree of exposure of the sector to transition risks. Data that indicate physical risks due to climate change through loans and investment. Data that indicate the extent to which financial institutions have invested in bonds aimed at promoting sustainability, the so-called green bonds. Of course, these data are not yet complete, but they are urgently needed today, not tomorrow. Because we need to know as much as we can to take on our role as a long-term economic advisor, not only for the financial institutions that we supervise and advise, but as policy advisors also for our governments, nationally and internationally, because they have to take the lead in the transition that must take place. They have to develop and enforce a clear climate policy, and they have to take the responsibility to enable and inspire the sustainable choices that we all must make. Tough, major choices will have to be made between intensive farming and nature, between fossil fuels and green energy, between heavy industry and air quality. We can help to make that happen in our role as forward thinkers, especially because forward means to me independent and for the long term, not under the influence of voters, not just until the next elections. And that is an important role we have to invest in, to be that angel or devil or the Jiminy Cricket on the shoulder of our politicians, whispering in their ears or pulling them to make sure that sustainable choices are not only made, but successfully stimulated and implemented. And that takes us to our third role, the leader by example. As an organization, we can and must set an example. We must make our own sustainable choices. For instance, in our payment systems, in our monetary operations, and of course, in our own investments as a central bank. That is our responsibility as the central bank. And that is why I'm proud that the Netherlands Bank was the first central bank to sign the principles of responsible investment in 2019. This marked the start of our journey towards the integration of responsible investment in our own account portfolios. In our internal operations too, we try to be as sustainable as possible in the choices that we make. For instance, in the renovation of our headquarters building, the product of which you will hopefully see behind me. In the choice of materials and in the choice of solutions for energy consumption. For example, we make the old concrete carbon neutral by injecting it with CO2. That is a world first. We will also have a lot of greenery in and around our building and up on the roofs. We will place nesting boxes and insect hotels in those green areas. And these features will help us building contribute to, to will help our building contribute to biodiversity right in the heart of the city of Amsterdam. We are doing all this not only to help the transition, to do our bit to save our planet, but also to set an example, a very practical example for the financial institutions that we supervise, for our clients, for our partners, and for the people in our country and the rest of Europe. Because the transition we need is not only a matter of policy, of rules and regulations, the transition we need is fueled by change, by changing people's minds and behaviors, by encouraging and inspiring people and businesses to think and act differently, to make different choices. And that is why it is important that you are all here today to talk about what we can do to advance the transition to sustainability to talk about how to take up our roles as supervisors and regulators, as long-term economic advisors and as leaders by example, about how to double down on our efforts to mitigate the impact of the climate crisis, to reverse the devastation of our planet, as your president also said in Glasgow. All while keeping in mind that saving the planet is a team effort. Or 
as Sir David Attenborough said during that same climate summit in Glasgow. If working apart, we are a force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, then surely working together, we are powerful enough to save it. Let me stop here and hand over back to the chair again. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Klaus Not and his speech at the opening of our conference. Now, let me introduce the host of our first panel discussion of the day on the topic of the future of banking and managing risks in times of uncertainty and inflation. Rainer Martin, head of research of National Bank of Slovakia, will head the panel discussion right now. So I would like to ask him to join us at the podium. And the participants of the first discussions of the day are Alexander Resch, the CEO of VUB, Peter Krutil, the CEO of Slovenska Sporiteľnia, and Paul Hebert, the head of systematic risk and financial institutions at European Central Bank. I would like to, gentlemen, ask you also to come up to the stage for the first discussion of the day. We'll take care of the mics and everything important. In the meantime, I would like to ask you if you would like to join our discussion today throughout the whole day, please go to slido.com and use hashtag 072023 so you can join us and ask the questions throughout the morning but also afternoon discussions. And if you don't have a mobile phone, then you can use at a certain time your hand. You can raise your hand and ask the question. We'll bring you the mic uh, throughout the panel discussions. And if you have your mobiles in a hand, please don't forget to put them on a silent mode throughout the day. Thank you very much. If we are ready, I would like to ask you to sit at your places. Uh, the, the host will be on the right, I was advised not to use combination of words far right. Uh, so you, you will be at the end, okay? And now uh, Alexander Resch, the first one, Peter Krutil and Paul Hibbert. So everybody also sees your names above you on the screen. And now please, Rainer, Martin, take it away from here. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good morning also from my side. It's a great pleasure and an honor to um, chair this first banking panel. We have two banking panels in the conference today. And uh, let me just briefly introduce a little bit the topic and then I will also introduce, of course, our distinguished uh, speakers. So we're talking about risks associated with climate in this session. and. Managing risks, identifying risks, that's of course part and parcel of the banking business. So there is, in principle, nothing new here. Um, we have done, as a profession, as commercial bankers, as supervisors, as financial stability people, a lot of progress actually over the last so 15 years since the global financial crisis. So we developed a whole array of indicators, of scoreboards, early warning systems, stress test tools. So we're well equipped to manage the traditional risks that the banking system is facing. But these are, as I said, traditional risks. So they are macroeconomic risks, they are financial risks, fiscal risks, credit risks, and so on. Now, what we're talking about today is, of course, something different. Because these traditional risks are now supplemented, so to say, by climate change and the associated risks with this process. And that raises a whole bunch of questions. So to start with, um, how do these new risks, these climate-related risks, how do they interact with the risks that we had to deal with so far? Do they require completely new tools, or can we adapt the tools that we are having so far, hopefully, the answer is the latter. Do we have the data that we need to deal with this? I think I know the answer to that, and it's probably no. 
But then the question is, how do we get there? What can we do about this? And <clears throat> the question is also, um, do we, are there any opportunities that are coming from this, that are arising as a result of these challenges? So I could think here, for example, about new products that will be developed by the banking industry and that can create business opportunities, of course. So we will take um, these questions in three separate rounds. So we will first um, start with what the key risks are at the moment and uh, how can they be managed by the, by the banks and then how can the risk assessment and methodologies that we have be improved. That's the first round and uh, round number two and round number three I will tell you when we get there. So let me <coughs> then also briefly introduce the three distinguished speakers I have here with me. And let me start in order of appearance. So first, uh, Mr. Paul Hebert. Paul is uh, Head of Systemic Risk and Financial Institutions Division at the ECB. And um, I think it's fair to say that he was one of the pioneers looking at uh, climate-related uh, risks in the Financial Stability Department of the ECB. So I was actually still there when you started this, uh, this endeavor. And I really think you're one of the of the first to, to do that. So he has a very long-standing experience with the ECB, with the IMF, and also with a range of other institutions. So he will give us the view from Frankfurt, so to say, from the financial stability community. Um, then the second distinguished speaker is Mr. Peter Krutil. He is chairman of the board of directors and CEO at Slovenska Sporiterna. So he was elected already as a member of the board of directors of the bank in, uh, in uh, 1998. So very long, very distinguished career with uh, Slovenska Sporiterna. And since 2018, he is chairman of the board of directors. And last not least, let me introduce Mr. Alexander Resch, who is the CEO of VUB Bank in Slovakia. He has been CEO at VUB since October 2013, so almost 10 years. He was also CEO of Intesa San Paolo Bank in Albania for two years. And interestingly, he was a chief risk officer at VUB uh, before for a couple of years, so risk must be close to your, to your heart. So on that note, let me start with the, uh, with the first panel. And uh, Paul, why don't you kick it off? Thanks, Kainer, for the kind words of introduction. I'm and grateful to be on the stage here, also with Peter and Alexander, to give uh, their real-world perspectives on what I might have a bit more of an ivory tower perspective. I hope not. Look, um, as Rainer said, I was early into the climate sphere. I don't know if I'd pioneers may be a bit bold, um, but what I could say is that um, early on, I, I was assigned the role of having to look into the question, which is usually a highly normative one. Many people have strong views about climate almost evangelical views. Um, and the, the question, the assignment was, please bring more data, some more analysis to the question, so we can make more positive assessments. And I have to say, initially, I was somewhat skeptical that this should be front, sort of front and, and center when it comes to our risk discussions. But with time, I think I've become more and more convinced that it has a role to play, and indeed an increasing role as we through through time. So with the slides, what I wanted to quickly just run through is some of the, the insights we've gleaned. So I think one of the, the first things to note is climate is often characterized as a problem of the future, in particular decades or even centuries long future. But I think what we've been realizing as we, we've been moving along is that this seems to be actually more and more a, a problem of the present. Um, we see more natural disasters, so the governor mentioned in his introductory remarks, um, the issue of drought. So two thirds of Europe last summer was under extreme uh, drought watch. And we've seen the warmest last 10 years on record um, throughout the world. So it's clear that something's going on. And what we see when we talk to the scientific community is that 1.2 degrees of this 1.5 degree budget is already spent. It's locked in. So it's not a risk. It's a baseline. And in this respect, there's very limited capacity to reduce temperatures below this 1.5 degree threshold at this stage. We have a carbon budget which is very little. And what we see in this chart um, up on the screen is that the following. You are either going to get climate risk in a form of transition risk or physical risk or both. In a sense, it's quite inevitable in this respect. Um, what we would rather have is this pledges and targets which bring us above, well above two degrees warming at the global scale. 
which brings us to these so-called tipping points, where you have natural disasters, both the, the occurrence, but also the volatility. So keep in mind, many of the discussions we often have about riverine flooding, which is a, an issue here in Slovakia, um, is not just that the level will rise of rivers, but the volatility would also be there. So it can be some quite extremes. And with that in mind, the other alternative, of course, is you see quite a sharp reduction in emissions, the green shaded part here. And if we were to have started in 2021, that would have been rather harsh. If we look um, at some sort of, uh, if we take a look at sort of financial portfolios and fix the industry composition somewhat, and don't allow for these cheap switches between industries, so we become entirely a service producing economy or something infeasible, it looks like around 10% reduction per annum would be needed for the next decade in, in emissions, which is unprecedented and very much similar to what we saw in the COVID complete lockdowns in 2020, where we had a 7.8% reduction in emissions. So clearly, we're going to either see a sharp transition or we're going to see uh, physical risk, which is pretty much unbounded. So that in mind, we've devised these scenarios. They've been referred to already this morning, and we're working very closely with this NGFS, Network for Greening the Financial System, which links climate scientists with also economic and financial professionals. And we have these three representative scenarios. One, which is a net zero transition, more or less the green line you see in this chart which more and more looks like a sort of optimistic scenario than a baseline. A delayed transition where you get a bit of physical risk and transition risk at the same time, possibly when physical risk is more salient. Think of the pandemic. When it became more salient, the lockdowns became more extreme. And you can have this interplay, which can be quite difficult. And of course, current policies, we have a lot of physical risk. Now, with that in mind, I think what's useful is much of this is going to lie in the future. So as the past is not really a good guide for what is probably to come. And what we have then a look at is where do we start from, I think is a good useful starting point. So on the side of physical risk, I'll start on this slide, then the next slide I'll just talk briefly about transition risk. <coughs> so on the side of physical risk, what we see um, when, is we take a very granular mapping of firms within Europe. Um, so we brought our, our climate databases from experts outside of our sphere, so Moody's 427 in this case. Um, we've linked it to economic uh, data of firms and also financial data in terms of credit exposures. What we see is the following. So on the left-hand side chart, you see these dots are areas over the next 20 years where we could have higher increasing exposure. And what we see is in within Central and Eastern Europe, so close to here in Slovakia, um, it seems to be more about riverine flooding, which is the issue, um, which is predominant. And in fact, when we did the breakdown by country, we saw around 20% of firms potentially here in Slovakia could be uh, subject to higher increasing risk over the next 20 years of flooding. Um, and that's the main one, to be fair. There are others, of course. Um, and you see that it's distributed throughout Europe. Now, the middle, I think, what is interesting for us is any individual natural hazard from storms, sea level rise, floods, water stress, heat stress, wildfire, over the next 20 years seems to be reasonably manageable. The difficulty is when you have any interplay of hazards. And certainly, water stress, drought, flooding, these types of things are related and can mutually reinforce. And what we found there is around 30% of bank credit exposures when we take our credit registry information to firms could actually be subject to high risk. And lastly, in the right-hand side chart, many people would say, well, fine, but this is all insured. Well, quite frankly, what was quite a big surprise to us was when we dealt with our insurance supervisory colleagues, they noted in survey data around 35% of economically relevant climate risks are actually insured, 65% are not currently in Europe. And that protection gap, if anything, is likely to grow with time. Just switching briefly to transition risk, I think what we see here is much of the action, I think that's quite interesting when we pivot towards banks, is that bank lending team tends to be majority, so around you see here, two thirds uh, in the red left hand most bar to high emitting firms, so currently high emitting firms. So you can see that it's a glass half empty or glass half full. In a sense, those firms are going to be the ones which are the agents of the change and bringing down reductions. It's the greening which will ostensibly matter for risk reduction, not the brown versus green dichotomy as of now. And in that sense, it's interesting to see that bank lending will be probably a key lever one might consider uh, would be very important in bringing down emissions, both for financial risk and also if you're somebody a firm believer in dual materiality, climate related risk too. The middle part of that chart with the, the, the bars is just showing us with securities holdings, there's a lot more action here in terms of reduction than you see on bank lending thus far in, in emissions intensive industries. So markets do tend to be a bit more focused on this at the moment. Banks are catching up and we see this inherent also to green loans versus green bonds or sustainability linked bonds data 
is that green loans or sustainability-linked lending is somewhat, quite a bit lower than what you get in bond markets. And I think just to note, before I depart this slide, it's on a right-hand side chart. It's not just the industry you're in that de determines your climate intensity of emissions. It's actually a huge variation within industries. And as you can imagine, credit rating agencies are hardly likely to start discriminating against industries writ large, but rather distinguish within industries which are the high and low emitting firms. So clearly best in class can have a role to play here. Now just before rounding out, I note, there are, and this slide has quite a bit in it, I won't go through it in detail, but what you can move of course is from climate risks and better understand economic transmission channels, also to develop a forward-looking view. And lastly, end up with financial risks. As you can see, of course, there's both micro and macro channels that would be at play likely um, in this green box. And in the blue box, all these different types of risk, which may be also subject to also interplay, market risk, credit risk, for instance, could be integrated as far as you have collateral values which are falling at the same time as credit risk itself is at risk. So this idea of interplay of risk categories is there, but to Rainer's question at the outset, we don't see this necessarily as a new risk a climate that would require a new financial risk category, but rather the interplay with existing financial risks is important, hence the prevailing vulnerabilities you see in the system and how they interact with climate risk is very important to us. And this is not to mention, of course, complex feedback effects. You can see the bottom dotted parts here, which we are working on currently in improving our modeling apparatus because I think it is, it is rather complex when it comes to the whole interplay of climate, economy, and finance. Lastly, and not least, to not depress you too much, I wanted to leave with you for a few opportunities. Um, so we've taken this from the, the Task Force of Financial Related Disclosures of the, in, in Basel, which had a final report in 2017. And what they noted, I think, was interesting was five opportunities you can see in the upper right-hand side corner here. And just let me briefly run through them. So one is the issue of resource efficiency. Um, so processes through innovation, cost savings and the like. Think about buildings, um, machinery, appliances, transport, mobility. These are areas where banks can make a difference to their lending. Second, energy source questions, of course, you know, wind, solar, wave, hydro, these types of issues. Third, of course, products and services, sustainability linked lending, green lending as alike. Fourth, the idea of markets, so new markets might be there in terms of green bonds infrastructure. And resilience is this idea that it will be in the long term important to re reinforce re infrastructure and that infrastructure lending per se or infrastructure finance can also be a key place where banks can play a role. So happy to hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Paul, for these uh, excellent slides. I think you're really very nice in setting the scene and, and giving the uh, the big picture, so to say. So let's now, uh, to use your words, move to the real world. And uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, Peter Crutiel to present us with his views on the issue. Yeah, I think uh, the r you, you, you said the real world. Uh, I think uh, sometimes, sometimes the, the, the presentations uh, prepared by you, this is the real world because this is for me, let's say, the the the, the 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 timeline and also the the structure how we 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 have to deal i think it's it's very well prepared this presentation and i i received this presentation yesterday and I, and i prepared only two slides somehow support this presentation as you said by real world but i think real world are all these risks we have on the table and i will not elaborate more because for sure you are much better by discussing on on uh, physical risk or transition risk but in Slovakia we have a little bit issue that uh, uh, as a small country we think we are not part of the game because we are too small and, and, and there are bigger guys who will solve for us and we are always only trying to see whom we will follow and what is good for us and I think this is a big mistake maybe if you I have only two slides, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and help me now to, this, this one, okay. It's enough advertising for Slovenska. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the slide, this is the slide, uh, the, the, sorry, is it in Czech because I didn't manage yesterday to receive your presentation and I think this is a good opportunity. This is the, the temperature change around the world and as you can see the, the, the red part is exactly finishing also in Central Europe. Where is, uh, for those who don't know where is Central Europe, this is where is also Slovakia. And, 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 and uh, in, from 1881, the temp uh, temperature increase in Slovakia by 1.8 degrees Celsius. 
in Europe in average 1.2. In other words, we are, we think we are in the country which is where is enough water, we are nice hilly country, but if you look on the map, we are in the part of the Europe which is affected the most at the moment. I don't know what's the future, I am not specialist for this, but I am always dealing with facts. Uh, it, it means from my point of view, the, 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 this issue or ESG issue for Slovakia is on the table, I think, as much for other countries and maybe more, for, for example, to my surprise, as for Spain. Uh, number two, I think, uh, what is problem in Slovakia? We live in 21st century with infrastructure from 20th century, and we are underinvested. And here we are talking about energy investments, which during the summer, atomic energies, which from my point of view are quite environmental friendly, they cannot go for full gas, as our German friends are saying, because we have no enough water. We have infrastructure which is, even when we are lucky, and maybe I'm not sure if I'll be here when we will have connected Eastern Slovakia with Western Slovakia by, by highway, but I think if temperature will increase, we need totally different type of infrastructure because of temperature. And I am not sure if we are dealing with this issue in Slovakia. We are trying to, these issue, pu, pu, issues put on the table, and uh, these are risks, which leads me to, to the question at the moment, and I have no answer, I have to say. If it's more important for us in the real world, as you are saying, to deal more with uh, these uh, physical risks, which are acute or, or uh, chronic, or with this transition risk. And from my point of view, we have to, we have to deal with both at the same time, and we have to have, let's say, the, the proper focus. And here I will, I will take, I will take only, only, only one, one more example that sometimes maybe we are focusing not on right things in, in the real world. Let's say. And we have to say, who is responsible for this negative development? And here I will take my notes because I'm afraid. The 31% disease, goods production like cement, uh, plastics, ammonia, and steel. All these goods production you can find in Slovakia. Then 27% uh, is the way how we are producing energy. Here I think we are quite okay, and I think in the afternoon Brano Stricek can talk more about this. Then agriculture is 19%. Transportation 16, and last but not least, 7% is everything that is connected with heating, cooling, all this stuff we are using at home. And I have to say, in uh, my real world, I'm discussing also with our partners a lot of time about electricity for heating, cooling, and there I see a lot of measures, which is only 7%. And we have to maybe more focus on, on goods production, how to, how to help our companies with uh, transformation to the, to, the, to the industry for 20, 21st of century. And I think in next next uh, round, if we will manage for, for time reason, I can, I can elaborate uh, a little bit more. <laughs> but uh, from my point of view, uh, the issue here in Slovakia is on the table. It's a big elephant, we have to slice in small pieces because otherwise we will not, we will not manage to eat. We have to focus on the right things and only focus on the right things but also do right decisions. And we as a bank, we as a bank, we as a bank, I think it was very well, very well um, presented by keynote speaker that we have to lead by, the, by example, we are trying to do so not only we as a, as a bank, but also we as a Slovak Banking Association. I think I can say also in behalf of the other banks. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, we need not only regulation. I think I'm responsible enough to, to know that this is serious. And if regulator will not tell me, I will not do this, uh, do my job. 
but we need we need uh, sub cooperation from from more sides and this is what as i said we will maybe discuss in 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 next round and last but not least how we can how we can what, what is the issue from my point of view we have uh, we have a lot of knowledge about about uh, about the 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 ESG, ESG area but we don't have data and i think you can manage only things if you have data and as a, as a as a one example I can use, and this is for real estate, for collateral, for regulator, we have to we have to collect data for green projects. And there is company Inforec. This is the government company managed by Ministry of Transportation. I hope I, uh, this is the right pronunciation in English because it's the, it's longer. And unfortunately, till now we cannot find agreement with them for sharing data. And this is for me the, 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 the simple, simple example how we are, let's say, we are, we are focusing maybe sometimes on the wrong things. We are discussing, we are, we are talking about, about cooperation, but if we need the, 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 let's say, the practical or real, real support, it's not easy for us to, to, to achieve agreement, I think, in basic, in basic areas, because it's only about sharing data that we have proved this project is green. That's it. And, of course, to finish my part a little bit, little bit uh, in an optimistic way, uh, for large corporates, clients, there is, uh, there is no necessity. I think they are, they are, they are, they are strong enough to, to deal with this, uh, with this issue. And I think there we, as a bank, bank we are dealing on, on questionnaire, and we are we are discussing how we can we can make things better. The real issue is, I think, on SME side and micros. There we we created so-called heat, heating map. At least we are showing the area where the the clients are um, active, how they have negative impact, and what they what they can expect in the future. In the future. For, 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 for doing their business. And, and of course, I think all of us, we are now in procedure of looking for third party partners who can help us in, in advisory, which is, which, is, which is something what our clients will need. This is, this is from my point of view. I think I try to, 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 to show the, the, the bigger picture and maybe then I can use some more sure. concrete examples. Sure. Uh -huh. And I forgot the second slide. <laughs> which you, you can here compare not only the Slovakia, but the whole world, what is the uh, impact, impact of, of uh, climate change on, 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 on which area in the world. You see there are some areas you can see optimistic view on Europe, but I can show you also some, so some negative, more negative impact on, on, on us as, 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 a, as, a, as a region. And, and I think this problem is you cannot separate Europe from, from Asia or from US to this connected problem. Thank you very much. Um, Alexander, anything to add from your side? Well, <laughs> first of all, I have not prepared any slides, so that's uh, maybe good for <laughs> the auditorium. Um, there's not a lot to add what has been said, but if I may, from a pragmatic point of view, what I see on my day-to-day -day business, um, I would say a couple of things. So first of all, physical risk is definitely a risk, as it was mentioned before. I would say the physical risk we are running here is mainly, led, uh, I agree with flood. We know this since a long time. We are living next to Danube, so we know that it's part of our business continuity plan if we talk about the bank. So from this perspective, uh, this volatility, that's definitely a thing we need to look at, uh, flo uh, flo uh, floating maps, also to include them in the evaluation of collaterals, for instance, to understand if our real estate collaterals are exposed or not. So that's one aspect. The second aspect uh, is definitely weather conditions. And here uh, we are talking about uh, agri-sector, so agriculture. We have a lot of agriculture, and the extreme weather condition might negatively influence it. Um, and this might have a repercussion, so that's uh, definitely another thing. I still remember 2004 when we had this uh, very 
stuck windstorm or hurricane in the high Tatras, which uh, wiped out a lot of woods. So this was a really heavy, heavy impact, which even 20 years after we can still see the consequences. So I, I think extreme weather condition, especially in forest uh, industry and this. If I mention one more for physical, I would rather say, uh, as a bank perspective, since we have a lot of real estate collateral, mortgages and so on, uh, the thing which will have an impact is the energy efficiencies of the houses, of the flats which we are financing. And this will might have an impact on our values of our collaterals, so which means loan to value policy and all this type of stuff. So there will be for sure also some thinking. We don't have yet the data, as Peter was mentioning. We are in discussion with Ministry of Transportation to get this data in a systematic way, sorry. <clears throat> Then a huge risk, what I see in this context uh, in Slovakia, is uh, the transition risk. Because um, historically, the industry or our economy is based or built on manufacturing. So if you, for instance, look at the energy intensity uh, linked to the GDP creation, the, the, the ratio is extremely high compared to other countries. It's 1.8, if I'm not wrong, which means we have a problem with our industrial model or economic model. And if we are not going to change that, we are extremely exposed uh, as a country and as a banking sector who is financing and supporting these industries. So from this perspective point of view, uh, there's a huge work to be done in economic transformation from manufacturing to knowledge-based industry. We have this discussion since many years, but I believe there needs to be something done. And the industries were mentioned before, steel milling is one, which is one, uh, fertilizing industry is another one. So there are a lot of industries which are present here and very much energy intensive, which leaves a certain footprint. So from a pragmatic perspective point of view, that's the, the risk I would say we are currently dealing with, mm. also in a concrete measure, how our credit policy should look like. From a challenging perspective point of view, the biggest challenges we face as single banks or banking sector is definitely, I would say data was mentioned, so I will not elaborate on that. I would say standards. Mm -hmm. There are so many different standards and way of measuring things, showing things, reporting things, that it's very difficult to consistently compare it and to make something meaningful out of it. So, and I'm not talking only about Slo uh, Slovakia, it could be European standards, world standards. So we need to work together here. And the last challenge, what I definitely say, we don't have enough skilled people to deal with it. If I look at our bank now, we need to deal with this climate, our risk manager need to evaluate, need to understand and all this type of stuff. Do we have the people? No. Do we have them for the sector? It's an education, our customers and everybody. And that's really missing and we need to do something because without knowledgeable people, skilled people, <coughs> professionals, uh, it will be very difficult to deal with it. And I will close here. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm sure that this, this is a big issue. And actually, not just for business, but also um, if, if you are in the, uh, the supervisory environment, for example, or in international organizations, the lack of skilled people who really have uh, uh, substantive ideas about this topic, I think that's a, that's a problem everywhere. So I'm not sure we're going to manage to get through all the three rounds, but certainly the second round I think we will manage. And I would like to leave a few minutes also for questions from the, from the audience. And that round two is, from a risk perspective, can and should banks drive the business decarbonization? ambitions. And I, I think, Paul, you showed a very interesting slide where you, you looked at the share of loans in the three uh, emission uh, category. And, and if, I, if I saw that correctly for the, uh, for the high emitters, it was basically stable. No? There, was, there was not really a change. The question is, um, what can banks, should banks, can banks do in this regard in their loan policy? And maybe this time around I would start uh, with Peter uh, okay. on that. Yeah, thank you. I'm surprised, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, what can banks do? Uh, I think it will be, and already Klaas Knot mentioned, and I like it, that uh, the, the, the central banks, uh, he see the, the, the role of central bank in three areas. This is regulatory, yeah, this is fine, and then advisory and leading by example. And I think it's very similar. There is no big difference what I can tell about the uh, role of banking banking sector. I will start with the 
the, the, the leading by example. I think there we are going the whole banking sector, at least in Slovakia, but I, I think also around the world, uh, around the Europe, uh, as a as a good example. And this is important part of our let's say task to to, to show to, to to others. You cannot ask clients to f to keep to keep environmental rules if you are not keeping them. Then it's, it, it will, I, I cannot imagine this by end of the day. Then, then uh, this, 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 this regulatory part. This is a little bit tricky, tricky one. Maybe now you, you, you say yeah, that banks cannot. Can, that they're, that we are overregulated or this stuff. Now I think it's important that, and, and I think he mentioned also during his presentation that we have to, we have to be very important part of the whole game. I think. Uh, also in Slovakia, in in, in last two three years, we went through the healthcare crisis, through maybe a little bit also, let's say, the economical turn, the some some, some small small small, wa small waves you can, because of war in, in in Ukraine, and if you if you if you look on, on the the role of the bank, we were part of the solution, but in year 2000. Uh, 2000 uh, Eight, the banks were the source of the problem, and, and, and in 2018 we we are part of the solution. And I think this is this is important yeah. for the banking industry as such to keep this this role also in in, in these environmental issues, in, in in climate change issues. We have to be part of the solution, but we are not only one who can help. And in Europe there is one big problem, and we know about this problem. It's somehow connected also with capital market because 80 percent of allocation function of European uh, let's say, financial industry is through banking industry. It's not capital market as such, which is a little bit easier, for example, for, for, for US. And, 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 and now, I think we are easy target for politicians that they will regulate this area through the banking industry. Of course, at the same time, we have to not achieve high profits and all this stuff, which, which, which is which, which is not easy for us to, 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 to manage all these balls in, in a reasonable way. And therefore, I think, and I like it, that we need cooperation, more stakeholders. We need proper fiscal policy, for sure, for cl climate changes. We need, we need proper public investments, which will support the right things, which will allow to, to, to change the climate change. We need some 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 financial incentives where we can play quite active active role active role and to, to, to support like we have now I can mention now electric vehicles as an example. And and last but not least of course is is proper regulation, which will regulate but not only banks but also other industries in the way that we are heading to the target as you presented on, on in your presentation based on the Paris Agreement. And and, and if all these things are working together, I think I'll be proud, be part of of, of this of this of this of these changes, and we can and we can we can we can play this role, the, the leading by example, and even and this is what we are do doing, that we are investing part of our profits to to be more active and quicker by. By, by, by taking these decisions. And last but not least, it's also business, to be open, because, because uh, now I'm using uh, McKenzie's numbers. At the, moment, uh, at the moment, we are distributing through the world. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to find something for Europe, but I assume the proportion is similar. 5.7 trillion US dollar to climate change. And if we are going to keep the promise from Paris Agreement, we have to invest yearly 9.2 trillion US dollars, which is almost double size. And I think, based on the fact, as I mentioned by the beginning of my, 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 my speech, that in Europe, we are, that the banks have very important role by asset allocation, we, we, we have a good opportunity to be part of the game. But at the same time, with the banking industry, and now I'm looking on some people who are not from the banks, and they are now, now developing the 
small capital market in in Slovakia we have to be also part of the of the of the we have to help them to develop also the capital market as such to have alternative solution for asset or capital allocation in 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 the Europe Thank you very much. I, I think you made a very important point about the uh, sort of financial sector being part of the solution or part of the problem. And I, I think during COVID we saw that when the banks were seen as part of the solution, also the, the whole political approach and the, the public opinion towards the financial sector was completely different, right? And so? I think so, yes. Okay. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to 2008 and 9, I would say, uh, yes, <laughs> that was a big change. I, uh, here I don't <laughs> fully agree with you. Okay, but... <laughs> Anyway, um, Alexander, anything to add from that? Well, question? yeah, sure. Um, um, from my perspective, point of view, definitely yes. You have mentioned it, COVID has shown the part we can play if we play together as a team. And it was also mentioned today, if we want to deal with it, we need to deal with it as a, as a team, from a team perspective point of view. So definitely yes. And I will uh, tell you a little bit more. So. If we look about this, I think there is one uh, significant role which Peter was mentioned before, also Klaas was mentioning before, and that's leading by example, education, and um, doing this type of stuff. So nudging behavior, change behavior of our customers and our partners. And I think here we can play an uh, uh, important and uh, very much important role. This means consumption, throwing up, what is the consumption doing with, helping the companies to manage this transition, so this is a clear role. Then the, the other thing which I believe uh, we, we are definitely part of it, Peter was mentioning it about funding. So um, when we are talking about Fit for 55, the 2050 ambition, when we talk about um, Repower EU or Next Generation EU and all this type of stuff, this transition costs a hell of money. And the figures were two years ago, they were estimated at 260 billion a year. A year or two years after, we are talking about 520 billion on a European level. Yeah? And uh, the public financing coming out from the recovery resolution from, from the national budgets, from different sources, are absolutely not sufficient. And we are talking here about yearly figures. So for breaking it down for Slovakia, this means roughly for in the next period of uh, eight, nine, ten years, it means four billion euro a year to finance this transition. Okay, and uh, just to give you a perspective, the whole lending, um, uh, the whole loan amount of the Slovak banking sector is 80 billion. Okay, if we say 4 billion each year for the next 10 years to meet 2030, means 40 billion. That means 50% of our lending portfolio, capital markets or banking markets, wherever, it needs to be put there. Mainly and uh, and that's, that's, that's a huge issue, a, ch a huge challenge, and there is a clear role of the banking sector, capital markets, where we need to work together. Otherwise, it will be not financeable, the transition which we have in mind. Then, um, what was mentioned also uh, uh, by uh, Klaas was uh, the cooperation with the public administration to be an advisor. This is very much crucial, especially when we see right now uh, the, uh, let's say, the path uh, to 2030, when we see the initiatives and the outcome of the initiatives where we right now in CO2 reduction, how our policies and initiatives bring results, we are not on a good track, honestly. Mm. So we need to work here together to make it measurable and so on. And the last thing what I would like to mention in this context is, uh, and this goes beyond single bank, that's more on a banking sector, on an association level, I come back to the standards and the data. I believe what we need to avoid is to find single bank solution. We need to find really standards and solution. I'm talking about, for instance, uh, ESG scoring of our companies because that's one of, uh, of the requirements. So we will flood our com uh, corporate companies. We will flood them with questionnaires. Uh, Peter will do it. I will do it. Uh, somebody else will do it. So from this perspective, the customer will be totally overwhelmed with questionnaires and scorecard. That's why on the banking association, we have created a working group where we do one ESG scorecard, which is shared and which is done for the whole sector. 
and available to all banking institutions and any other institution which would be interested, for instance, for procurement processes or whatsoever. And then we can enrich it, each of us can enrich it, whatever, but at least we have created a common basis. The other thing with the cadaster information about energy efficiency, it's badly needed in order to understand. We have a million flats in the country, a million houses in the country. What do you think? A lot of things to be done, because most of these houses and flats were built uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. When we talk about houses, it's 40 years ago. They need to be renovated. We need to have inf information. We need to work together with the building society to understand which kind of shablonas we can upgrade and all this type of stuff. And there again is our role as an intermediator between customers and companies who are doing this, bringing in the technology. I see a clear. And last but not least, what I would mention is energy poverty. What do you think uh, the most exposed uh, to this transition? Who can finance it? You think in our, um, now I don't want to offend anybody, but middle Slovakia has a lot of houses which need to be upgraded in, in terms of energy consumption, in terms of heating systems and this type of stuff. And uh, they are still using, sometimes in some valleys, they are using wood or coal. Mm. You think that's good? That's not good. And they are most likely not the richest one who can afford it. So we need to shape proper programs in order to avoid this energy poverty. So it's another topic where we as a banking system, we can for sure play a role. Yeah. No, thanks very much. And uh, I think you're touching also on a few issues that we will discuss later on. Uh, there's, for example, a special panel on, on construction and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and housing that looks into this. So um, you managed to attract a lot of questions already. Uh, so this is very good. It's very, uh, very active here. Um, I have to be a little bit selective. I don't think we have the time to go through all of this. So there are two questions here which um, look more at the sort of supervisory action. So the question is whether there is thinking about um, specific capital risk um, uh, requirements, for example, or changes in, in risk weights. Um, now, Paul, I, don't, I know you're not in the SSM, and of course I don't ex expect you to disclose anything you shouldn't disclose, but maybe you could give us a bit of a, a view on, on where the current thinking is in these fora? Sure, yeah. Um, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, so, uh, thank you, <coughs> Leon. Just to pick up also on Peter and Alexander's very excellent points, um, I think what's true is this, this, this idea that what we can measure, we can manage, you mentioned, Peter, and I think it's true. Data is at the key, and I think at the heart of this. So thus far, the supervisory and regulatory community has been much more about information, capacity, knowledge building. So the stress test we ran for, 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 for banks last year within the SSM area was really a learning exercise. There was no capital uh, implications associated with this. Um, also, we ran thematic reviews to better understand best in class. So obviously, it's learning not just, you know, if you will, top-down regulator, supervisor, and bottom-up from all of the banks, but rather amongst each other. There's also, obviously, a lot of work underway. I can see it resident in this panel, and it's learning from each other and benchmarking. And that's effectively what we put our, much of our emphasis on. So what we see in, in Basel, where I think is, is obviously the, where you'll see capital regulation or the European Banking Authority um, necessarily uh, emanate from, is they want a holistic view, so across all pillars of banking supervision. So not just capital adequacy, per se, also thinking about supervisory questions, which are more, very much tailored, to a, a specific bank's um, sort of businesses, and also, most importantly here, perhaps pillar three disclosures, so really about disclosures and data. So on this, on this front, I think what's important to note um, is I think uh, the, a couple of points I'll pick up on what Peter and Alexander said is obviously um, Europe is very much an SME-based uh, continent still, and I think uh, the points were made that effectively it's building capacity, working with these clients is going to be critical because you cannot hire a climate scientist in a micro firm. It's just not feasible. No? So in a sense, it's really about sharing knowledge and sharing that we have the ability to, 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 to exchange views across those. A and B, I think the other thing that was mentioned was risk materiality, and that's key. What's material, I can talk a lot about Europe as a whole in a consistent as possible way, but that's not really necessarily relevant mm. for the businesses, for the areas in which you're, you're dealing here, of course in the banking industry, and this is where I think the difference can be made, no? In business strategy adaptation questions, through to just how you think about risk from the lending process, from the beginning, from you know, due diligence, controversial client activities, the likelihood of this, 
through how you manage risks, through the collateral valuation alike. And that very much has to be, I think, done necessarily at the bank level in tandem with the supervisors. So again, will a big hammer come? I'd be very doubtful about this on the supervisory side, regulatory side. Thank you very much. There's, a, there's another couple of questions here so which... Uh, one I can integrate here from a practical perspective. Absolutely. Please go ahead. It already has an impact, not maybe in terms of risk-weighted asset, but definitely in the lending policy. Um, what commercial banks uh, are doing, they start to uh, go into the sectors, subsectors, seeing the impact and uh, making a lending policy decision. Do I support this sector or not? To which extent do I support this sector? And it will have an impact, and it's having already an impact uh, to our companies, partners, and so on. And there's an intensive thing. This will have an impact also in the pricing. If the sector is not favorable, uh, it will be a different pricing policy. There will be some add-ons potentially. And then in the future, there might come also some risk-weighted asset regulation related to this, just to support it. Green mortgage is one of the ideas to give some capital reliefs, which then will have an impact on loan to value. So what will be uh, the, the money uh, single households will get for buying their flat and house. And so it's already happening, already happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there's a couple of questions here um, which all go in a, a similar direction. Um, and, and the direction is to say, well, if here in, in Slovakia or in Europe we, um, we decarbonize and we put on additional uh, burdens on business, so to say, at least that's how it's said here, then um, what are the consequences of this in terms of um, international trade, so are we not exporting the pollution to the outside? I think that's a little bit the, the argument. Right? So um, I know this goes a little bit beyond the remit of the panel, but it, it's, it's something where there were quite a, quite a lot of questions here. So any views on this issue, on the sort of international dimension? I, I, I don't see your questions, even I send it five at least. And <laughs> 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 uh, the, 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 the people are saying that we are we are not keeping our competitiveness compared with those who are not, let's say, following these strict rules for decarbonization. I, am, am I right? Uh, it's, 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 it's this is a little bit the idea. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because this this is typical typical way how we are discussing with uh, with our especially corporate clients. They see it as a as a as a, as, a, as a way how we are decreasing our competitiveness towards to the countries where, where maybe these, these, these things is not as important a topic for discussion, uh, not only with the regulator, but also with the government. What I'm saying, I think uh, by end of the day, it's about, for, I see it as an opportunity, because if, if you are going in, uh, in, in way of decarbonization, and I think this is even an opportunity for the Europe, because for sure we will not, uh, we will not win competition with Asia or Europe in, in ATR area. The, the, the game is over. We, we, we will, this is not the, the, the market where we will win. There is only one, I think, technological company in Europe, and this is SAP. That's it. Everything else is in Asia or in Europe. But environmental or climate change issues, this is something where we can build our competence and where we can keep uh, the Europe uh, as, a, as a place where we can compete with the rest of the world. And I think it's only a question of time, based on your presentation, the others will come to the, to the same results and we will, we, we, we will go in, in, in the direction to, to, to decrease the, 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 the production of um, greenhouse uh, gases. Yes, so. and, 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 and this is the way how we are trying to, to explain. Of course, it's, it's, it's not easy and this is, I think, also Peter Hughes is in his, in his introduction speech that we have to focus on also on long-term targets, not only on short-term targets. And this is valid not only for politicians to be open, but this is valid also for shareholders in, in corporate companies, because they are, it, it has negative impact for short-term, let's say, financial health of the companies, but at the same time, it can give them opportunity to, to be more competitive in, 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 in long run. And this, is, and, and this is the way how I'm explaining, and there is one more, element in, in the whole story, and some people are overlooking this. You have to look also in, uh, on demography, because 
Slovakia is the country where in 10 years from now we will have less people in the country by 2.7 percent. Now I'm using OECD numbers. And the reason is demographic development. But at the same time, maybe this is demographic can change due to the fact that we, you can build good place to live for those who are not taking care for the people in which in which environment uh, you, you live. And, and, and this is another opportunity for us as a Europe, because for, for sure demographic curves are not very favorable generally. And you can, you can, we, can, we, can, we can, let's say, change the, this trend which we see in, 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 in our favor. This is, this, is, this is second point and last but not least, and I have to say here, uh, Klaus Knod, I think he, he mentioned a lot of a lot of figures all about young generation. I can prove it, because our young, even as a as a labor capital, you can you can hardly acquire young talents to the bank if they don't see that you are dealing in a responsible way with these issues. And 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 I have to say there maybe sometimes from from our older generation point of view too sensitive on, on these issues. They, they they really they are sometimes taking decision based on the on the on the on the fact how the company is responsible, for example, in environmental area, but not only environmental area, and this was very rightly mentioned by, by Alex, because these environmental issues is part of this the, the, the social poverty which we are here talking about. And 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 uh, Simply, we have to support those clients who are negatively impacted by this, and from long-term point of view, we can manage in the way that it can become our advantage as a, as a place to live, as a place to work, as a place to do business. I think, I hope this is, this is for us, this is a, for us opportunity, because as I said, the, the digital economy Unfortunately, or IT companies, this is something what this this train is already gone. Any additional comments on that? I think just just to say, I think we can be ahead of the curve in many respects yeah. um, in this. So one need not see it necessarily as exporting uh, frugality here, while the rest of the world loosens their belts. Right. No? Right. So in a sense, I think what is true is, is and, and to be sure, it, there should be a distinction drawn between exclusion or tilting of a portfolio, be it lending or securities holdings. The strict exclusion, I think the problem doesn't disappear, it just migrates. But of course, if you tilt and you progressively tighten through time, you can do basically quite, quite a bit. This is not just about point in time emissions. I think one has to be clear. It's about the speed at which you're actually reducing them. And that can be managed, I think, quite well. And the disclosures that accompany this and those tilting related requirements, you can actually tighten through time. And I think engender also potentially positive change for the counterparties. Uh, that's that's true. Um, before we close, um, there's a few more questions, but uh, I think we're running a bit out of time. Is there anybody who did not use this but has an important question he or she would like to raise? Okay, if that's not the case, then let me try to summarize uh, this a little bit. Um, and it, it's, it's not easy. I think it was a very rich discussion. Uh, I, would, I would take a few points, though, uh, from this. So the first one, I think this is, this is quite an important one to say that um, uh, the climate risk is not, not necessarily something that should be seen in separation from other risks that we have in the, in the financial business. It's, it's more something that does come on top, but it sort of permeates through all the other risk categories that we that we have, and, uh, and, and I think this is also the way we, we should probably look at this in, the, in terms of the um, uh, analytical toolkit that we have in the banks, but, but of course also with the, in the supervisory um, agency. So I think that's one thing. Then uh, data, yes, uh, of course, that's uh, uh, front, left, and, and right, I think, uh, to, to have that. We didn't go into, into too much detail here, but I think there was one important point saying that it takes a combined effort of all uh, parts of uh, also government and, and administration to make this available, right? And, and this is something that, of course, in the, in the NBS, in the research department, we also often see that, uh, you know, cooperation could be, it's good in parts, but it could be even better. I think that would help 
um, a lot. Um, and then the, the third point on Slovakia, yes, I mean, uh, flooding, of course, this was mentioned as, a, as an important uh, risk, also the transition risks in general. I think that was a very, very important point also to raise. Uh, Slovakia is a highly industrialized country with a lot of high emission industries and the question is really and I think that's a political question also how this will uh, will play out um, yeah um, I think also the the issue of cooperation within the financial sector is important uh, if all banks do their own solution that's that's clearly not very efficient and, and of course the regulator has an important role uh, to play here and uh, and I like the point a lot that uh, that it's important that banks are part of the uh, of the solution in, in this whole uh, rather challenging um, issue. So on that, I would like to close here and uh, thank you very much again, uh, dear panelists. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much to Rene Martin, to for leading this panel discussion and our distinguished guests for taking a part in it. And now I think we have a short coffee break planned. So for next 30 minutes, enjoy some coffee and something a little to eat. And we will be back at 11 o'clock sharp with another panel discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>